It's no secret that uh, my amateur spannering attempts on this channel from time to time have been an understandable source of amusement to those of you out there, and after all there are many, who have some degree of mechanical competence. I have to admit to having an inbuilt ineptitude when it comes to these things, and my past endeavours at fitting various post-purchase accessories and upgrades to all of my bikes have often been haphazard affairs based upon seemingly endless trial and error, rather than on a well thought out and methodical approach. Such is my impetuous nature that these examples, often laughingly labelled by me as how-to videos, end up being masterclasses in how not to. But as I've always said, I'm happy for others to ease their way through similar processes by way of my own schoolboy errors. Yes, after too many years of parts being fitted the wrong way around or in the wrong sequence, straightforward tasks morphing into hour-long episodes of sweating, cursing and often abject failure, I've developed an increasing admiration for professional mechanics and those talented home mechanics who can seem to almost intuitively turn their hands to any task. I'm acutely aware of all those sagely voices proclaiming not like that you idiot as I fight with one piece of gadgetry or another, convinced that my intuitive powers obviate the need to pour through the instructions and prepare properly for the task ahead. I'm basically incompetent, but at least on a conscious level. As Dirty Harry was fond of saying, a man should know his limitations. Believe me, I do, and the bar is pretty low. All of which puts me in mind of the frustrations surely felt by all experienced practitioners of a certain vocation, trade or craft when they happen upon conversations around their particular speciality held amongst armchair keyboard critics who clearly know next to nothing about the subject, yet insist upon waxing lyrical about how things should actually be done. I suppose we've all been guilty of this particular trait from time to time, but there are those who seem to elevate the process to an art form all its own. Whether it's doctors, teachers, politicians, civil servants, professional drivers, there's no shortage of constructive criticism out there from people who know, well, four-fifths of Foxtrot Alpha about anything. Now I've come across this myself more times than I care to remember, both as a serving police officer of 30 years and indeed since retirement from that role. It is absolutely understandable though that a subject as important as law and order occupies the concerns of a population more than its profile might otherwise suggest. After all, the fear of crime and disorder is very real and examples of policing incompetence, real or imagined, are legitimate targets for public opprobrium. I will be the first to concede that history is littered with examples of poor operational decision making, resulting in poor outcomes, sometimes tragically so, and occasionally honestly taken actions in the crucible of fast moving operational incidents can lead to unintended consequences. Consequences 
which will often become the primary focus of media coverage, to the complete exclusion of the attendant or preceding circumstances. Now, to my mind, there is no area of policing more susceptible to this out-of-context reporting than the complex subject of police and firearms. I've served for a number of years as both a tactical firearms commander and a strategic firearms commander in one of the biggest police forces in the country. And so, whilst I freely concede my ignorance across most other aspects of life, I will most humbly suggest that I can offer, shall we say, some informed comment on this particular subject. And I'll put it no more strongly than that. Now, of course, I don't blame people for getting hot under the collar about what the police do or do not do in situations where lethal weapons are in the mix. The public cannot and should not be expected to understand the complexities involved complexities which necessitate years of training and repeat training for those officers charged with discharging such duties, whether on the front line or in a command centre. Expressions such as, just shoot the bastard, are never in short supply from many an armchair critic, whenever incidents of this nature hit the media. But these kinds of sentiments are largely driven by the Hangham and Flogham tabloid press, none of whom have the first clue what this kind of policing, or any other for that matter, actually involves. Now, I'm all for a free press, more so than many of my colleagues, I suspect. But the ability and willingness of the likes of the Daily Mail, the Daily Express, the Sun, note here that other toilet papers are available, to completely misrepresent police actions in these sorts of circumstances has become a scourge. I shouldn't be surprised that the continued manipulative conduct of these publications, but I am surprised and indeed saddened at the number of people willing to be manipulated. When, as a society, did we lose the ability to think for ourselves without being spoon-fed an endless succession of half-truths, the better to feed a grotesquely distorted narrative? Let me give you an example, but before I do, I should just take a moment to explain what a tactical firearms commander and a strategic firearms commander do. As I've said, I've held both posts over a number of years, yet I've never actually held a firearm in my hands. Believe it or not, the closest I ever came to the actual hardware itself was whilst in the company of armed officers during a briefing or debriefing, or during demonstrations of the capabilities of various assets in a training environment. I hate guns, and I wish to my very core that they did not exist anywhere in this world. Firearms commanders are not ordinarily authorised firearms officers. They're located remote from the theatre of operations itself, usually in a command hub of some description, 
where specialist tactical advisors are on hand to inform the often difficult and highly consequential decision-making process. There are good reasons for this. Making sound operational decisions around the authorization for the deployment of overtly armed police officers into public areas requires cool, analytical, balanced decision-making and a broad overview of all the circumstances, not those which present solely at the scene. A tactical commander will usually deal with the early stages of a spontaneous incident when live events can present in rapid succession requiring a speedy yet considered authorization for the deployment of armed officers. A strategic commander will either deal with future planned operations or the later stages of a spontaneous incident when there is time to gather more information and to pull together a detailed operational plan, which will then usually require further authorization at gold commander level. Strategic and tactical commanders will normally be at silver level. In either case, the commander in question is required to apply his or her mind to a whole host of factors, such as the nature of the threat, the location, the presence or likely presence of members of the public, particularly children, the ability to contain the area with inner and outer cordons and to staff them, what intelligence is known regarding any suspects, what witness accounts are seen, and any broader risks to the public, the number of suspects involved, the likelihood of local disorder breaking out, and a proportionality test, and many other possibilities, each of which have to be considered, actioned, documented, and where appropriate, implemented. It's far from straightforward, and if you get it wrong, you can end up in the manslaughter dock. Now, all of this being said, it is of course down to individual, highly trained armed officers at a scene to decide if a shot is to be taken based upon a perceived threat to life. These actions have been enshrined in UK law for many years, so when certain elements of the media talk about so-called shoot-to-kill policies, they reveal their complete ignorance on the matter. As do those who ask why suspects have not been disabled by a shot to an arm or leg, rather than an often fatal shot to the body. Now this is the easy bit to grasp. Where a suspect represents an immediate threat to human life, there is one objective and one only, and that is to stop him. Hollywood style shots to limbs are the stuff of fiction and fantasy. If someone is about to take a life, you need to be certain that any shot you take hits its target. Missing is not an option. That's why the largest part of the body, the torso, is targeted. There is never an intention to kill, only an intention to stop, which often results in death simply because of the proliferation of vital organs in that part of the body. A wounded suspect is still capable of discharging a weapon and killing someone. Well, I hope that was of some interest to you. Not the most uplifting of subjects, I know, and uh, not a motorcycle-related subject, really. But with so much nonsense being peddled in so many quarters, I just thought I'd give an informed perspective on the real world, not the imagined one. Unfortunately, uh, this week, the shocking weather in these parts has prevented any sort of ride out and on-board filming and commentary, so reluctantly, 
I've resorted to uh, voice overing some footage, albeit footage in a beautiful part of the world. So I hope you'll forgive me that on this uh, rare occasion. So, until the next time, and in the meantime, ride safe, be kind, and I'll see thee.